Hello, everyone. How's it going? I'm Carrie Sundra of Alpen Glow Industries. This is the Wednesday Solder Sash. Woo -woo! Um, you might notice that there's like <laughs> that there's a different background behind me, and you might think like, "Whoa, they like totally moved locations or whatever." No, this was here the whole time, and you just didn't know it. Oh my god. Yeah, we finally like changed the room around so that we had the cool background actually behind us <laughs> in the background rather than just like off to the side and out of camera. And uh, it actually freed up a bunch of storage space. So like all of that is sort of like messy stuff that you can't see. So it's great. <laughs> awesome. Plus that's like, probably the stuff you need to look at, right? So it makes total sense. I know, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> and hello, Bob, joining us. How's it going? Um, so yes, I have Dave with me. He is Unicycle Dave on Twitter, and uh, he has unicycled across Canada, which is pretty darned impressive. And he also likes hardware hacking, and uh, he's got he's got some lights, which I am hoping he'll tell us more about because they're stage lights and they're DMX lights, and I don't know anything about that system. And I know that there are protocols and systems involved for like theater and stage lights, and I would love to learn more about that. So, um, yeah. yeah, I don't know where we should even start. Should we start with like unicycle shenanigans or should we start with <laughs> lights? And what Why don't I do? talk about these a little bit? Um, just because I'm probably going to start fidgeting with them. Um, and I can kind of explain like what I've been building and why. And then we can, uh, yeah, we can go into, I don't know, we can talk about whatever else makes sense. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so basically I... The camera that is on my hands right now is something, it's actually like an 80-20 rig with like a 3D printed gimbal and all this stuff. So it does like positional and, and it's got like a zoom mode and stuff as well. So you can also like, woo, like have a look in and like check closer at stuff. So it's kind of a neat little widget. Um, uh, however, the lighting for this part of my room sucks. And so I went on this like over-engineering journey of like uh, building some lights and um, it started probably like a year and a half ago. Um, and basically I, I had designed these boards, which are um, actually, there's another piece of hardware that I bought, um, which is like these little like smartphone size, like bicolor, like lighting things. Yeah. Um, I think we and they're really them. cool. Yeah. yeah. Like they're fantastic. And like, uh, I love them a lot. However, there's one on me right now, um, but they they die, right? Like you have to charge them. They don't run over power. You can't control them remotely. And they're not as bright as I wanted them to be. So I did a little bit of shopping on DigiKey. I found these like 95 CRI modules in two colors, um, did some research, learned about aluminum PCBs. So like this is an Ooh. aluminum board, which, uh, yeah, it was really cool. I've done, I've spun a couple boards in my life, uh, but this one is cool because it's the first time I've done anything in aluminum. It gave me an excuse to do that. Um, and the end result, like, that I thought would be cool. Oh, and there was something else that tied into the project, which is I had um, sliders that came from, like, one of those high-end, like, film um like mixing boards that have like a servo controller on them and Ooh, so like they move to a position if you want them to yeah yeah, yeah. and i was like oh what if i built a lighting board for my desk and then i was like well okay i'm gonna be dmx so i can like tie it into like another system if i want and like all kinds of it just led to yeah, what, vastly yeah. over engineering this problem what is the <laughs> so, yeah. system and protocol because like I, I i hear that all the time but i've never really worked with stage it's, lighting or like real you know kind of theater so lighting so it's yeah. so simple. So DMX is um, RS-485, which is like a oh, serial yeah. protocol that's also used, yeah, like for like industrial control and stuff like that. But it's literally just mm -hmm. RS-485 at 250,000 kilobaud, and you just send out 512, it's called DMX-512, because you send out 512 different um, settings, one after the other, and you just repeat that over and over again. And you just you just do that, and then the lights just listen for the start of the packet, find where they are in their in the address space, and go oh like those are my values, and then set whatever they're doing an actuator or anything that you're doing brightness, uh, like they just translate that into whatever they're supposed to do. They do it. Um, there's no like the light cannot communicate back to the board in most setups. Okay. Um, so it's really just like. 
the board is like, do this, and the lights do it. Lights, and that, that's it. Just like dumb receivers, basically. Yeah. yeah so, exactly. so for anybody listening who's like not familiar with uh, like RS-45 and other things, um, you might already be familiar with like UARTs or maybe even RS-232 protocol or uh, serial communications via those old school DB9 dongles that, you know, used to plug into the back of your computer, which USB has pretty much kind of made obsolete, kind of. But uh, RS-485, so it's a serial it's a serial protocol. There tends to be a transmit and receive. Um, and R so RS-232, there's like a dedicated transmit line, a dedicated receive line, and you usually have ground. You can have other signals for handshaking, but they're not absolutely necessary. And um, and basically, it's very, very similar to just like transmit and receive UART communications that come from a microprocessor, but just like level shifted and, and inverted a little bit. So you usually, in order for um, in order to hook up like a processor directly to a computer, assuming that it has a old school DB9 port, <laughs> you would usually still have to have a chip in between that did like a little bit of level shifting and, and uh, converting. RS-485 is similar, but it's differential. So uh, it basically, you can run it for longer lengths and it is more, uh, it is less sensitive to noise. So yep. I imagine it would be very good for theater applications where, you know, yep. you might be running hundreds and hundreds of feet between your lights. And it's multi-drop, which is the other thing that's cool. Oh, so like yes. You, can, you right. can stick multiple clients on a single one without screwing right. it up. Um, yeah. and actually, um, this is my, so I chose to do this in like maybe the most silly way. Like what I should have done was spin a board. Um, but I needed some meditating downtime. So I chose to do a lot of like this super fine uh, solder. Uh, I'll zoom in on that. Um, but basically like this, these are, uh, this is wire wrap wire, like the the 30 AWG, like multicolor stuff that you get on a wire from like AliExpress or whatever. And I just, uh, I don't know, I spent a couple evenings like slowly assembling these units. There's going to be eight lights in total. That's why there's so many like, widgets on my desk at the moment. Um, this is the, this is the RS, this is the, sorry, the DMX compliant like um, input output module. So this little guy here is actually the RS-45 chip. Um, mm -hmm. This is the optional terminating resistor. So if you're at the end of the line, you flip this switch on the light and it goes like, hey, I'm at the end of the line and it reduces the reflections back and forth. Um, so you actually like, you get better signal integrity if you have the option for that resistor. Sometimes it doesn't work actually on longer runs if you don't have it. I've learned that the hard way. There's an opto isolator and a galvanically isolated power supply. So, um, yeah, so this is like a piece of this that's actually like, this is, uh, specified in the DMX spec, like the isolation. Um, and it, the lights don't need it. They're never going to leave my workshop. They're using, uh, GX 12 or sorry, GX 16 connectors. Um, like at the end of the day, but if I ever did want to make an adapter, you could plug them into a lighting board, which I think is cool. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, in case that's ever necessary. So, yeah, yep. I don't know. Bob says it's termination really cool. is good in most cases. Yes, especially with the long signal runs, for sure. Exactly. Yeah, which yeah. like I am sure you're aware of. Uh, I learned that the hard way at work actually because we were doing some serial communications to knitting machines. Um, oh, I really? can talk about, I'll talk about that in a bit too. I, to I totally want to hear about knitting machines too. I, yeah. I mean, oh, they're so cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so basically I was just going to plug this in quickly just to show, because the yeah. light is bright and it's light, but um, also the interface is kind of fun. It's nothing super fancy, um, but basically there's an ESP32 inside here. That's what this little board is. It's a Wemos uh, ESP board. Uh, this is a, a power supply converter and a secondary power supply converter because there's you need it basically comes from uh, sorry 48 volts comes in to reduce the number of um, amps that are required on the wire to power all eight eight lights because they're they're 36 watts like wow, per yeah. head maximally uh, ideally they're never actually that hot but there is a fan like in in this assembly with like a little heat sink um, and that's why there's an aluminum PCB and all the other stuff. Anyway, I had a lot of fun designing it. Um, but basically, yeah, so there's an ESP32 that controls this um, and then voltage converter. And then this board here is just like one of these. So there's like three little switches and there's room for one of these like OLED displays to just pop nice. on. Nice. 
And so like there's a select up and a down. Um, and then these are MOSFETs that control the with a driver transistor. So basically the circuit can uh, with PWM dimming, uh, like pulse width modulation dimming, uh, can change the brightness of the LEDs like however you want, like within the scale as per the DMX request. So so yeah, so that's basically like those are all the pieces of the guts for how it works. Um, and I have my power supply here. I was just gonna like plug it in. Uh, yeah, channel two. Um, cool. And me and meanwhile, what I have going on in front of me is a TV be gone that I've been meaning to put together forever. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's like, yeah, it's cool. It's an evil mad scientist kit that we got off of Adafruit. Um, I think it might be maybe a collaboration because the, um, the board has Adafruit uh, URL on it. So yeah, I'll be I'll be soldering that up so that I can turn off TVs at random. <laughs> I love those kits so much. They're so fun. Um, I haven't done one before. Them. I'm excited. I've been meaning to forever. So it's just an awesome excuse. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, I was just gonna show just a little bit. Like, uh, woo, yeah, it's bright. <laughs> um, but basically, yeah, you can see it's very bright. And then like this is, you can use this to control it manually with like the three buttons here um, oh, cool. with the screen. And then you can set a DMX address. Um, this doesn't yet save to firmware because I hate writing code and I just, I'm doing that part last. Um, but yeah, so anyway, that's uh, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm fidgeting with at the moment. It's like my, the project that I really want to get done um, the other thing that you can't see is that I have like five lamps in here that I really like. And when, when I come in in the morning, I have to like, it takes me a long time to turn all my lamps on, man. And I would love to be able to just hit a button uh, and change my lighting around. Uh, so I'm really <laughs> looking forward to that. So, um, awesome. yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, um, cool. Yeah. I now have to figure out which resistor goes where. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. Tablet tablet issues here. <laughs> I know. I to find to... out. Oh, they're totally putting this together in a different order. The instructions are like in a different order than I really kind of want to do them. I tend to like to put like the low profile stuff on first and then like work my way up uh, to the higher profile stuff when I'm doing uh, yeah. through holes. And then they've yeah, kind of started with higher, yeah, they've kind of started with higher profile things, so. And then uh, it's just really hard to hold it in place, which is just I the most annoying. I agree. <laughs> I totally agree. So, yeah, I'm trying to see if do the resistors have, no, it doesn't have the names on it. Um, I think I have a different kit than this one. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Wait, or maybe not. No. Uh, it's on the top. Version 1.2. Oh, 1.2 yeah. it is. Okay. It's just a different, I guess it's just a different color that's throwing me off. Okay. Yes. Now I have it properly oriented. Excellent. Um, cool. I'm just going to match resistor colors and hope color codes and <laughs> Hope that everything turns out okay. <laughs> I always have to look at a chart for that every time it gets. Yeah, you know, I I just go straight to the multimeter because that's how I yeah. roll. Yeah, <laughs> I have a bin here that is just like my like. Oh no, it's not that one. Whatever. There's a bin of shame here somewhere that's just like all the components <laughs> I took out of a perf board or out of um like a proto board and was like, I'm not gonna sort that. Yeah. And then when it gets really dire, I'll like go through with my with my multimeter and be like, okay, what am I looking for here? Um, <laughs> when I can't find something, I'm also realizing I really should have bought a solder stencil and paste for this. I'm using like a Ooh. like a syringe of solder paste. Um, but what I'm gonna do is this this is a tool I actually to buy to assemble these, but I'm going to use it so much now um, because oh, the yeah. It, it's like a, it's a hot plate, right? Like it's just got yeah. like two um, heaters on the back. It's not the world's fanciest hot plate. Um, there are better ones. I know Adafruit recently, maybe semi semi recently, had like a little tiny one that was like a couple, like maybe a square inch or something. 
that I nearly bought, um, but I needed slightly more space. Um, and this has done the job really well because when I tried to do, like I do have like a hot air station um, that I use, like I do a fair amount of surface mount soldering. Um, yeah. But uh, it just wasn't cutting it. This board was absorbing the heat too well, and I was not able to actually get anything to stick to the board. So I had to buy the hot plate just to yeah. um, be able to do it all at the same time. So just yeah, um, to be yeah. able to heat it up, heat it up for sure. So I'm yep. going to do the tedious thing and manually apply solder to each pad on this. Uh, <laughs> um, and normally I do this with a podcast, and it's really chill, and it makes me really happy. So. <laughs> <laughs> What uh, what size components are those? Uh, I don't actually. Know. These are L because they're LEDs. LED? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, like I do not know what the <laughs> what the specs are. Like, uh, are they addressable? Like, WS. No, these are just um, they're just like two pins. Um, okay. Like your yeah. Um, yeah. They are. A quarter of a watt at 3.2 volts or something like that each and so and they're high CRI but I didn't want I didn't feel like I needed multiple colors I really just wanted like the, the color temperature adjustment um, more than anything in here so there's like a cool there's there's a cool one and there's a, a, a warm one and basically you can turn you can adjust them both independently so like depending on the sunlight in coming into my room, I can like match it. And that was basically like the use case. So nice. yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, it's, it's see. good to have, uh, I like having the the option of, of warming or warming up or cooling down lights. Yeah, like even this one here being able to like adjust, like it doesn't make too much difference, but um i don't know anyway makes me feel better uh and then especially at night i can like i can warm it up a little bit and be like oh, okay maybe i'll actually go to bed on time um <laughs> so um so yeah so i guess I, I can ramble forever by the way you just need to tell me to shut up if you have something else you want to talk about or you want to <laughs> no, like no, um really this is the point. Uh, the point is is okay. sitting and chatting and and rambling cool. and learning stuff. So no, you're you're Sweet. good. I just figured I'd throw that out because I'm like really good at just talking forever. Um, I uh, I was gonna say a little bit about where I work at the moment. Um, yeah. Which deals with uh, industrial circular knitting machines, which is I think really really cool. Um, yes, I want to so, hear all about this stuff. I'm a hand knitter. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so like this is a vastly different process. Um, right. But yeah. um, still worth talking about, I think. So I work for Shirtex, which is a pantyhose manufacturer in Montreal um, that makes like ultra strong pantyhose. They have like a special fiber that they use to make a knit that's stronger than most pantyhose. Um, they work. They do what they say. Like, you know, they're a legit product. Um, they can be quite expensive, so like they're not for everyone, but uh, I think they're cool. The technology that goes into them is super cool. A lot of it's under NDA, but um, mm -hmm. the but one of the things I do get to do, which is really cool, is um, that basically the way the knitting machines work, they have like um, 400 odd needles in them, and it's like a cylinder that spins around in a circle uh, on, with a with a light vacuum like pulling down the sock, and it's kind of like a corking, oh. I guess is the name for it. Um, yeah. And it just like, there's little fingers that are pneumatically actuated that actually like drop the yarn into the needles and like pull it out based on the pattern that like someone has programmed into the machine. Um, and they're so cool. And we have so many of them and they speak RS-485. Um, yeah. So one of the things I had to do um, as part of like the engineering work is we were trying to get them into like our operation software and um, yeah, it turns out that you can talk serial to them if you say the right things in the right way. Um, so I got to build these little boards that, that actually do that, which was really cool. Nice. Um, I feel like I don't have any photos of the machines, but it's worth looking up like pantyhose knitting machines. You'll get videos <laughs> that like, um, I don't even know. Like it's just like one of these really cool processes. They're super intricate. It takes like a long time to even learn how to like program or use them. Like there's a lot going on, mm. um, but they're so cool. Like you can do like patterns and you can like 
you can change like the stitch height. So like the the taller your stitches, like the more room you'll have like in the leg for like whatever thing you're doing. And, yeah, like, more the looser the gauge, sort of the more flexible. Exactly. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's like but the needles are a constant like like it's just this thing that is it's like the heart of the machine so like you can't change the number of needles and you can't change their size like they just are what they are <laughs> um, right so they so instead of changing like the number of stitches in the circumference of a sock they essentially change the, the maybe the, the yarn weight and the tension of each stitch yeah exactly yeah exactly cool yeah and so like it's a whole yeah but like now, the, the are videos these, with those factors are so cool. So okay, oh, sorry, so, so is this are these machines sort of specifically made for pantyhose, or yep. can they also do like socks and hats and things like that? Versions of the machines can do socks. Um and I guess hats, I never even thought about that. But yeah, I guess hats. Um normally the yarn is like quite thin. It's like um right. like you know, uh, I don't even know the denier off. Yeah, I mean, pantyhose, like, you know, I mean, that's, that's got to be super. They're sheer, right? Yeah, that's like tiny, yeah. tiny thread. The yarns um, are wild. They float in the air. Like, it's it's crazy. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that must be nuts to try to work with yarn like that. And that also is elastic. Like, knitting. Some of it's elastic, yeah. Really elastic. God, that's. Yeah. I mean, tension has got to be such an issue, like consistency of tension yeah. as you're unwinding it from whatever spools or cones or whatever it comes on yep. as it goes through the machine. Um, yep. Otherwise, it would be so, like all lumpy and inconsistent. You'd actually find, yeah, like this is a key thing. It's like they have a thing called a creel, which is like all of the pipes and stuff that support the yarn packages that are like above the machine and then there's like a bunch of feeders that sit in a in a ring like above the needles that actually manage exactly what you're saying like the tension and then yeah when you get into like stretchy lycras and all this other stuff like um it's yeah. absolutely like it the, the electronics are wild like i've taken apart some of these things these devices um and uh it's so cool like they've got like brushless dc motors and load cells and other stuff that they use to like uh yeah to just like on the fly detect what the tension is and then adjust Dang. how much yarn is being fed into the machine um wow it's so cool and like you, you have to deal with like temperature and humidity and like it's just like yeah you know i think like a lot of industrial processes like uh which is like one of the things i like about my job uh, is like mm -hmm. kind of getting to learn more about that, but just like, yeah, like the intricacies of what makes those things work and what makes them not work and how to like control them more accurately. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, this might not be an issue. This might not be an issue for that, but um, depending upon how consistent the, the yarn is in the first place, that mm -hmm. is also something that, um, you know, it turns out that that hand knitters and hand spinners and things like that can like adjust on the fly for oh yeah like, inconsistencies in the yarn right whereas getting a machine to do that is very difficult yeah absolutely. I, I don't know if it like if it's a if it's a kind of like elastic kind of fiber that is being made by like a process that that's kind of like the rayon where it's like dissolved and then like spun through like pushed through these little spinnerets and then like re-solidified that tends to make like yep. pretty consistent consistent yarns. yeah and i think like they've pretty much like for nylons and lycras and and stuff like that like rayon and stuff like they've pretty much figured out how to do that at this point yeah uh, i feel like yeah, it's um, different so, from wool which is just gonna vary with the sheep right like yeah Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you can like <laughs> test it as much as you want, but it's going to be what it is at the end of the day. Yeah. For sure. So interesting. Um, yeah. So I don't know, That's but cool. it's, it's been cool. Yeah. So how did you get I, into STEM and working on knitting machines and yeah. you know, working with hardware? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, if you know the right people, you know. Um, <laughs> So no, uh, like more seriously, um, one of the things I've always just had an interest in is like electronics, like ever since I was a kid, like uh, dumpster diving computers with my friends uh, where I grew up, um, like just kind of my jam. Um, and I actually don't and never really have had much of a background in like doing engineering on a 
a more like professional level. And I, I think I have some kind of like, I, no, I, I absolutely have imposter syndrome about not being like a quote unquote real engineer. Um, as I, you know, put, yeah, right. As I put like LEDs on a circuit board that I designed myself uh, that works, God damn it. Um, a college education is but one path. And it yeah. is only well, but four years of one's life. <laughs> and this is, no, but like, and this is super yeah. the thing and I'm slowly getting over it. Um, but no, my background's actually in um, film and IT. Um, so I worked on film sets for a number of years as yeah. an IA certified, like IATSE 667 uh, data imaging technician. So I used to do like uh, video backup. So like um, when the first digital cinema cameras came out, I was like one of the first technicians that was like backing up the files off of those cameras, um, kind of as my day job. Yeah, it was great. The hours were terrible, but <laughs> yeah. film, sets, film sets are a good time. Uh, for, it, well, for a while. Famine, right? Like you either yeah. ha have no project and nothing to do, or it's like 24 seven. Precisely. Yeah. So, um, so that like in terms of work stuff, like it was that, and it was like, you know, um, my uncle introduced me to Linux at a young age. Um, and ah, I, you know, I was going to ask taught me how to use VI you. when I was like 13. Uh, nice. you know. So was, was he sort of the one who also like mentored you with, with electronics and things in general or, or kind of no. got you interested in that or? It was more like just the spark of interest. And then oh. it kind of ran from there with like friend groups and exposure to like other folks in my immediate community. There's a guy who ran kind of like a, an IRC server in the town mm -hmm. where I grew up, um, where like you could get yelled at for writing C code if you wanted to. Um, <laughs> and by that, I mean like you would write C code, but it was like kind of the more old school, like people are mean to you on IRC kind of thing, if you don't know what you're doing, um, which thankfully, I, I've heard about I think this. is on its way out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was I don't never recommend it. IRC, but I've heard about this. <laughs> yeah, I honestly like. I'm glad that we're starting to move on uh, from this kind of jam. Um, yeah, but it was quite formative for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so oh, okay, they all fell out. We're good. Um, so yeah, so I think there's like that, but I was always more drawn to hardware, but never had the resources for it. Um, until yeah. I, well, you know, really had some expensive until time. recently to make your own circuit boards and stuff, or yeah, or exactly your own circuit boards because the software was all very, very expensive initially. Yeah, yeah, and now you can like go grab a copy of KiCad or KiCad or however you say that. I don't know. I use it a lot, and I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, yeah, we go back and, and forth. <laughs> cool. Um, and like Fusion three hundred and sixty is free, and like you know, and I like built my own 3D printer a couple of years ago, which like now I have a cruise ship because uh, I like myself and my time. Um, <laughs> but it was a it was a very uh, formative experience also to like do that kind of stuff. So I think the long story of that is like I, uh, my hobby experiences were very useful when um, they were looking for someone to do kind of like prototype hardware engineering, machine interfacing and data gathering stuff at Sheertex. Mm, um, yeah. And so like we we built out like some IoT boards. I actually have sitting on my desk because I work with them fairly regularly. But we have these like little guys that are just like an ESP32 board um, oh, cool. that can speak to yeah. machinery. Uh, it's got like some 24 volt tolerant inputs. They can talk to PLCs and other industrial stuff. Nice. Um, yeah, but it was like I was ready to dive in. And it was also like the first year of the pandemic uh, when I started. And so it was a real good time to fill in all the gaps in my knowledge because there was nothing else to do except be sad. Um, yeah. So I'm kind it, of amazed. The stars kind of aligned there. I'm kind of amazed that a pantyhose company like got through the pandemic because I would have thought that <laughs> with people working from home, there would be less demand for pantyhose. <laughs> yeah, there's, and there, so, there is, it's super yeah. real. That, um, that must be rough. That must be rough. It has started to pick back up again and they're still venture funded. So like it was actually probably a little yeah. less stressful than it otherwise would have been because we were able to like shut down operations, do some engineering and then uh, pick back up again. Um, and like it wasn't easy to turn the factory back on again, but it was possible. So, yeah. Um, but yes, absolutely. It was a weird, it was a very weird time. I spent <laughs> a lot of time in my room just like, you know, learning how to learning how to get better at making circuit boards. And it was a real good excuse to buy some nicer equipment for myself. So I got like some, like a decent scope and power supply and a bench meter and stuff like that, which nice. is invaluable 
yes. if you're trying to do this work, honestly, like, I don't know how I got by without a current limiting power supply that I would could like program. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. Like, what stuff did you, you get know. out of curiosity? I got the DS 2072A, like the Riggle one. The, yep. Um, cool. And it's great because I hacked it to be the more effective version. Like, you know, you can do that update. Um, yes. I've heard, I've heard about these hacks. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're not, anyway, it's not complicated uh, if yeah. you Google it. I don't know how much you talked about it on the stream, but um, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the hardware, especially if you are like at the lower end of the price range, like I, I think my experience with a lot of like the entry level like Chinese electronics hardware is that they're selling something that has multiple capabilities um, mm -hmm. for, yeah, for a decent price. Um, yeah, no, totally. I, I, I have a Reaper scope too. That's a, it's a slightly fancier one. It's like an MSO for input and stuff, but Ooh, cool. like, right. Yeah. Fancy. But, um, <laughs> that was the thing. It's like, I, I needed a four input scope for um, a project that I was working on at the time. And um, you know, they're, they're kind of expensive. And while I deeply love Tektronix, uh, yeah. that was a budget for me. <laughs> totally. Yeah. But absolutely. Regal was, and it's a great scope. Um, the only, my yeah. only thing is that like going back and forth between Tektronix and, uh, and Regal, they have different UIs. So now I never uh, know what any of the buttons do on any scope ever because my brain is <laughs> permanent. <laughs> So I did. So I got a mechanical keyboard a couple of years back, and uh -huh. I ended up, um, I ended up just programming all of like because I have a work laptop and a personal laptop, and then this keyboard, and I just remapped all my keyboards to just work like the mechanical one does. And I know you can't do that on a scope, but I completely <laughs> feel you on like doing that <laughs> or, or like that <laughs> struggle because like oh my god the amount of times now that like i have like if you if i push like caps lock w it like starts playing music it's just like how the keyboard works um and like because i'm a huge dork i remap my arrow keys to the vi keys uh so like eight like caps lock like hjkl and now when i use another computer like i'm useless uh, <laughs> because my muscle memory for arrow keys just isn't it's... what they are anymore <laughs> Um, yep. So yeah, that anyway, that sounds infuriating. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> eh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. But uh, yeah, no, I, um, cool. I kind of um, I was running into that same sort of thing using um, so I was using uh, Altium actually um, a couple oh, years cool. ago, and it was for like you know paid consulting work that that needed Altium. Um, mm -hmm. And I was using uh, Fusion 360, and which is not free anymore, sadly. Um, oh. Yeah, they, they, they're, since they were bought by Autodesk, and like there's, yes. yes, and there's like, Eagle was bought by Autodesk, and now there's a lot of bundling and, but you can still yeah. be grandfathered in on like other plans and deals and stuff so okay that's must be what i have because mine still opens and i haven't questioned <laughs> it um nice but Good yeah i was on the like yeah i was like on the like oh i'm a maker like and and like i have used fusion 360 at work but my yeah. version that i use is legit like you it's know, a great tool paper holders and like yeah like stuff for my house like that i've drawn it's a great yeah. tool i i love it yeah and it beats like the fee beats SolidWorks any day, but yes. you have similar parametric capabilities. So yep. yeah, I yes. I really like it. But yeah, so I was going I will back say it pisses off engineers when you tell them they have to use Fusion and they're used to SolidWorks though. Um, yeah. Or not pisses them off, but they're like, okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so sorry. Like the like... KiCad and Altium thing, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. Was, really hesitant to start using KiCad, but KiCad is actually surprisingly excellent, I will say. Yep. Um, yeah. I, like once you get your footprints free, in there. Yeah. For a free program, I have nothing but great things to say about it. But yeah, I, I was, yeah. so the problem was I was like going back and forth between the electrical solid modeling and the mechanical solid modeling. And they mm. both had different uh, like different ways of moving the model, the 3D model with the, right. you know, your mouse. And yeah. it was just like, I was never, 
doing the right thing. And it was <laughs> driving me crazy because I was like trained in Altium and then I was going back and forth and getting mixed up all the time. And then I got a space mouse and oh man, oh. that was money well spent. I just got the compact Amazing. one, like the, the cheapest, smallest one, but like suddenly I could use just one tool for both programs and have yeah. it set up the same to move the model the same. And oh my gosh, that like saved my brain. Totally. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like <laughs> these little things, right? And it's like, oh, uh, so, so not having to. Which, which yeah. selling points? Which selling points are you? Did I, did I hit of, or were we talking pantyhose? <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah. <laughs> or knitting machines or oscilloscopes. <laughs> Sorry. Oscilloscopes. <I> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Bob oh, says he has a Windows laptop for personal use and a MacBook for work. And yeah, he has the same context switching issues. <laughs> yeah, I need to fix that on mine so that like the, um, yeah, the keys work properly. Uh, <laughs> because I have that problem because <laughs> I have a Windows PC for for home and a, and a Mac for work. And it's great, but um yeah, sometimes it's a little annoying. <laughs> so I feel that. But yeah, the less work you can make your brain do with dumb stuff like that, the more you have freed up to deal with all the other things that you have to deal with, in my opinion. So I try really hard to set that stuff up properly when I can. Yeah. So does that hot plate work in lieu of a solder oven? Like a refill oven? Yeah. Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. It just heats up the bottom surface. So it's great when you have like a single sided board because uh -huh. you can just like place the board on there. It'll heat up the whole thing and it'll just like reflow the entire board and you can watch it, which is kind of That's cool. cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can sort of watch ours, but the teeny tiny window is like, yeah, it's yeah. Not, not great. Um, but yeah, obviously you can only do one side that way, um, but it heats up the whole board very evenly, which is nice. That's cool. Of course, it has a small, the small ones like that have, you know, limited size. Yeah. So you can't like really do a panel unless it's like super teeny tiny. So I already had the oven when I learned about these little guys. And so it was kind of like, oh, if you have the oven yeah. and if you have the air gun, then I just, I haven't, I haven't found I looked a reason for it. at buying an oven and I think it was just like, uh this made more sense just because yeah. it was so cheap um yeah. honestly yeah. like How much it's was a very that? simple device i'm trying to remember like 50 bucks probably yeah that's like, not bad. Yeah. and it's temperature controlled and you know uh and someone already engineered it for me which is great um, well the, so. yeah the ovens i got are the ones that are um they're like the aliexpress already have solder profile stuff built in so yeah i didn't yeah. have to do any it wasn't i didn't do the toaster oven refit though i have done boards in just standard toaster ovens before and that totally works you just have to kind of babysit it a bit cool i thought about that too and just decided like this was nice because it fits on my desk yeah. <laughs> uh, and i live in an apartment in toronto there's only so much room <laughs> um and yeah uh, it, I basically have taken over the entire master bedroom of the apartment that I share with my partner, um, which I am eternally grateful to them for allowing me to do. But I have like a literal, actual metric ton of junk. Like I mean that in like real weight terms. And it's great <laughs> junk and it's well curated junk and I'm really proud of my junk, but uh, it <laughs> takes up a lot of room, you know? I, I you probably understand uh, what Sounds I'm saying. Sounds like from this one is I'm really proud of my junk. <laughs> 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 Definitely. <Yeah. laughs> Working yeah. subtitle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm down for that. That sounds great. Um, so yeah, anyway, there's a junk shelf you can't see, but uh, <laughs> it's organized at least. Hey, um, organized junk is the best kind of junk. Yep. I also, the other thing, actually speaking of organization, this is something that I feel like not enough people appreciate in my life and I can show you guys while this is like cooking. Um, I bought these little like um like smt component books like you can get these from aliexpress yeah. uh you can tell where all my spare money goes but like so i got like the capacitor kit and i got a resistor kit just to like have it because i was yep. often switching stuff out and i tend to work in 0805 unless i have a pressing reason not to 
Um, mm -hmm. Just because it's a little easier for hand assembly, which is like where most of my prototypes land. Um, but then I got an empty one and I put all of my like uh, stuff that's like the miscellaneous bits and bobs from the ends of my digikey orders. And I just write like the digikey part number on the sleeve. And then they're all separated by like, um, by like the type of component that it is. Um, nice. And it's been so nice because like I had like just these like massive like binder clips full of bags, just like holding these digikey bags. I could never find anything. Uh, but this has been really cool. And it was like a couple bucks and uh, I probably spent about half an hour and just like sorted all of it out. And it was so satisfying and so <laughs> Um, oh uh, yeah, here we go. It is yeah. deeply satisfying to organize things. Absolutely. And to, yeah. to find the perfect storage actually for something is deeply yes. satisfying. <laughs> that is exactly it. Yep. And actually one of my friends also found a bunch of these on the side of the road in Montreal, but they're like these little trays full of like tiny bins that I can put like, I've got like my capacitor kits here, like Wait. in front of me. So they're- hang, hang on. You found those by the side of the road? Or a friend. Yeah, well, I did, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. amazing because like those are super handy little bins. They're they're, they're so no, good. they're called really useful boxes, aren't they? Oh, like okay. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know how to buy them because they've just been given to me in bulk. So <laughs> Does, do they say really useful box on them? Like in like in the um like molded no. into them on the on the front no. maybe by the handle? They must be in they must be a knockoff. I don't think I see any. Oh, uh, they look like the really useful boxes. Interesting. I mean, they're really useful. And I found <laughs> right? actually, I could poke holes in the back, and then I have pegboard hooks that are in the back. And so I've mounted like four of these. Well, I'm, here, let me just, I'm going to do the weird thing and mess with my camera. So yeah, do it. Off. But like, I put up like a pegboard. Um, so I have like my oh, tools. Nice. And I put all of these on like a secondary pegboard. Mm -hmm. And so like yeah. all my switches and like uh, these are uh, PCBs, like dev PCBs, mm -hmm. capacitors, and then miscellaneous project parts. But it's like, it's all there. And so I can just reach and grab it in front of me like when I want something. Um, and it's, nice. it's again, it's like about really like for me at least when I'm trying to get stuff done, like removing the cognitive load of like having to like think about this stuff all the time. Okay, that looks like it's done. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, um, I care, yes, I care deeply about workshop organization. <laughs> <laughs> um, Love it. And it's like, it's an ongoing process and it's not something you can outsource. Like you just have to do your workspace for yourself. Um, <laughs> right? Like, so, Ro yeah. Robin, I, Robin and I are both like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We spend we spend a fair bit of time organizing every now and then. We kind of go through go through phases for yeah. sure. Yeah. Labeling yeah. Phases. Yes, labeling phases. The label maker yes. is also a very handy tool. Oh, yeah. I'm a I'm a cloth tape. I do cloth tape. Yeah. So I take this and I write on this and I stick it to what I'm trying to label. Um, do you have very yeah. neat all caps writing? Uh, no, it's like it's nerd neat, maybe, but like uh, like my desk over here, like all the drawers are labeled with like little bits uh -huh. of cloth, and like I have a I have like a metal tool bin back there that's got like my wire and my camera gear and stuff. But anyway, there's just like nice. there's usually just a label on every bin that roughly says what's in it, um, which is for no one other than me. But it can be really helpful, honestly, just to be like, where did I put that like you know, folding palm keyboard or that like- oh, yeah, it, it saves or... a lot of time and it saves frustration too of like knowing that yeah. you have something but not knowing where it is. That's that's very frustrating for me at least. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was feeling that way. I had another kit that I was thinking of building but because I just haven't done it yet, but um, well, this ties into several stories, but um, Someone that I met at a unicycle convention gave me this kit, which is he bought at a market in Korea, which is a mosquito repellent kit that he found, like, I don't even know where, somewhere <laughs> in, in Seoul. Um, and I just have never built it because I, yeah, I don't know, I just never made the time. Um, so and this I have is an electronic kit. Yeah. It's like so it like emits like, some sort of noise, maybe, or and that's I think it's like an oscillator kind of deal, and there's like a little piezo speaker in there and some resistors. So yeah, I think there's like a little there's something like that going on. I haven't ever opened it, 
Um, I can still. I'm going to do one more of these first, though. Um, I wonder if it also uh, keeps away. I wonder if it also repels youngins who can actually hear my frequencies. Yeah, right? <laughs> Maybe that's what it's for, actually. I'm, I'm not mentioning um, names, but somebody I know has made a device like that. <laughs> Which I think is hilarious and awesome. <laughs> That's so good. That would be perfect for me because my hearing is trashed from listening to music too loudly in my headphones for too many years. So, um, yeah, awesome. Uh, so unicycling. So tell me yeah. how you first got into unicycling. So uh, um, I've told the story a couple of times. Um, I grew up in St. John's, Newfoundland, and I was mm -hmm. walking down the street one day. I might have been rollerblading down the street, actually, like as many wheels as possible attached to my feet, um, because I was a deeply cool child. And um, basically, a guy rode by on a unicycle, and I was like, where where did you get that? Like, they make those? Like, what, what's the deal? Anyway, he told me, like, where he got it, uh, which was a store downtown. There's like, a bike shop that was, like, a reseller for, like, a, a unicycle brand. Um, mm -hmm. Nor actually, no, it was a Norco. Anyway, Norco, the bike people. Um, and yeah, I bought one, uh, got, or sorry, I got one for my birthday and learned how to ride it and got like completely obsessed, uh, just like utterly obsessed. I, w I guess I was like 18 at the time, mm -hmm. um, which was uh, several years ago now, we'll say. Um, and uh, yeah, it like, I just, I super fell in love with it. And and the thing that really brought it home for me was probably like, I spent a summer learning how to do tricks on like a sort of like what they call a freestyle unicycle, which is like something that you use for trick riding. Um, okay. 20 inch tire, like size of a BMX or whatever. Um, but then like, at some point, I feel like it was like, yeah, a year into my knowing about unicycling, there's a forum, like an old like web style forum, um, that like like uh used to be it's like the outgrowth of like rec.sport.unicycling like the news group and that was like the way that i would like learn about unicycle tricks and like mm -hmm. what was going on in the world and i read about these people who had ridden across the alps on unicycles they had bought these like um 36 inch tires that were like brand new a brand new idea at the time it's still like the largest pneumatic um like human driven tire if i don't know how better to describe that but like 36 is like the largest tire size you, so you can get for a bike um and this was like a brand new thing and they were like riding across the alps and i was like i want to do that and so i got one of those and then i started going to unicycle conventions uh, which are a thing it turns out um <laughs> uh, like everything that's cool there's a convention for it um and i would do like distance riding um, and like meet other people and like ended up going on a tour through the Mediterranean and like uh, just doing all kinds of long distance unicycling. Mm -hmm. Turns out that's a thing I really like to do. So, yeah. So are you more of a, like a road unicycler then than a, like a mountain yeah. biker unicycler? Because I hear that that's yeah, a yeah. thing too. Yeah, mountain unicycling is super a thing. Yeah. Uh, uni yeah. is like the short term, yeah. Uh, so I am a road, I am absolutely a road unicyclist. I don't do super well off road, um, but I have done a lot of distance <laughs> on the road. <laughs> quite experienced. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah tell so. me about how you planned the your trip across Canada, and like, I don't know, <laughs> like what was the remotest area that you went through, and how long did it take? And all yeah, that yeah. So. It's the, again, the lighting sucks, but the the poster my parents made for me, it's like behind me. Um, like you could see it's like kind of my my uh, social media profile picture and then like <laughs> Canada with like the line that it that I took. Um, I planned it just by, I guess, just like it's one of those things. It's like I don't know how to describe it. Like sometimes there's stuff that you just got to do, you know, like yeah. I'm not sure that I ever really had a choice. <laughs> um on the whole like you just like i'm gonna do this um and so i started to like obsess about it and i really am like i'm a planner um like at heart i think in general i really like knowing like the details of how i'm going to do something and so mm -hmm. i had a pretty chill day job at the time i was working at technicolor like the post-production place um uh, which i don't think is technicolor it doesn't really matter and so i was just like 
researching like what the routes I could take were and all and like how I would carry the stuff I would need to carry and like yeah yeah how do um, you carry stuff that you need to carry yeah around? so I wish I like I don't have any my touring unicycle is downstairs I do have one next to me but it's my um my indoor exercise unicycle um which I could tell you about after this if you're curious it involves 3d printing um hmm. So, I, I've actually seen a fair number of unicycles because unicycling was a big thing at the college that I went to. Right. Um, yeah. But it was also like I was I was sort of in a rival dorm, so it was like things, <laughs> the things that other people did in the dorm across the way and stuff. So that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> I know unicycle oh, rivalries, God. right? Like <laughs> uh, it's so silly. I mean, it's so silly. But yeah. I like I, uh, yeah. the most impressive ones were like the super tall ones. Yeah, like there was one that was probably like the seat. Oh God, I don't know how tall the, it was. Probably fifteen feet high, and that's, all, that's like ankle breaking height. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And like watching people like, learn foot. how to ride that was crazy. And even just like the the getting on it, the mounting from the ground and like swinging yeah. up on it is is impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, uh, those are those are known in the industry as giraffes. Um, yes, a yes. Giraffe unicycle. Yes. Or if it's like shorter than about four feet, uh, I usually call it a penguin or like a penguin giraffe. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure why, that's just what you call it. Um, but yeah, so like, so carrying stuff is really interesting and everyone yeah. does it differently. And actually one of the things I love about just like touring cycling in general is it's like, there's no real like one size fits all, like how you, store your gear on your bike or, or whatever you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And I just think it's so cool because like when you're touring, you find other people and they set it all up differently. So the way yeah. that I did it was I bought off the shelf bike racks and I drilled holes in my frame and I put one facing forwards and I put one facing backwards and I bought um, like 20 liter dry bags, like big blue dry bags mm -hmm. from, from Mountain Equipment Co-op and and uh, because it actually rains in canada not unlike it, california oh my God. Where it does not rain <laughs> ever yeah it, the weather was interesting at times for sure uh so yeah i wanted them to be waterproof and i bought like basically replacement equipment for attaching panniers to the racks and so okay. i like yeah. put a piece of coroplast inside and then like basically screwed that to the side because the problem with um panniers for unicycling is that you get heel strikes because your cranks are so short I was gonna, so, like uh, how is there even room for a rack on a unicycle like i might be able to explain a little huh. better but like uh hold on. I, I do have this is like not the optimal device for this but like uh, it, it's gonna be hard to see because of the lighting but there's a unicycle and yeah. here i like i have a hole for like a rack that's like that goes here and so Okay. ignoring the pipe that I'm holding on to, but it would like come off over here like this. And then okay. the the actual panniers would only hang down just a little bit. Oh, and so okay. yeah. you get the clearance, but they have to be custom and they have to be modified. Okay. Um, that makes more and sense. So, huh. Yeah, exactly. And so that's that's how I made it work. And and it was with a bigger tire. That one's a 700 C um, <laughs> wheel. I was using a 36. So there's a little more room for stuff. But I did carry like a tent and a drone and a GH5 and a tripod uh, sleeping bag, like all the stuff. Like I had way too much crap with me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. It was it was a lot of fun. Uh, it took me 111 days to do the trip, and nice. it was 9,250 9, kilometers. I have no idea what that is in miles. Um, but. <laughs> Three thousand and some. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot. A long way. Um, I mean, it's across Canada, right? Like it, that, it, it's yeah. across North America, and not exactly. at the skinniest yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, and I and I did. Um, I took like a lot of side trips because I was like, well, I'm here and I'm in good shape. Yeah. Like I would, you know, I would like go to see friends. Uh, I would go to see stuff that was like worth seeing. I thought that was kind of on the way. So like, um, yeah, I don't know. It was really fun. What was a typical like daily mileage for you? Um, I, so my brain works in kilometers, but uh, like, yeah, sorry, it, kilometers. But average, all right, we'll we'll try to translate here. I would <laughs> say you just have to translate for me, or I can get out an app 
Um, but uh, I would do like a hundred kilometers a day, roughly. Um, kilometers a day. Okay. So about an hour's worth of driving I would do in one day. What is that? Like seventy hours? Like, so like, like that. Well, it depends upon how fast you're going. <laughs> Are we talking freeway driving or <laughs> freeway driving? Absolutely freeway driving. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It was good. And so, and the thing that is really cool, like the reason why I didn't do it on a bike, which makes way more sense and is a lot easier, um, is uh you meet so many more people when you're that weirdo out on the road. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, why are you here? How did you get here? Where are you going? And um like on a daily basis, like several people would pull over and they'd like offer me snacks and like places to stay and like, you know, just kind of like concerned people. I've received two Bibles um, <laughs> while riding my unicycle. I guess I looked lost and the Gideons were like, okay, I'll need a little bit of something. Right. This guy um, definitely needs God if he's yeah, on that. Like if anyone needs a Bible, it's this guy. Yeah. Um, you know, and like, you know, people, yeah, like, uh, places to stay and stuff like that. And so it's just like, it's just, it's really cool because you kind of have that gimmick that, uh, opens up like a couple more doors than you might, if you're like a, a more normal, like bike tourist type. Um, and that, that was really cool. So. Nice. Nice. So yeah, 60. So a mile, one point six is oh okay. It's a little yeah. It's a little <laughs> a little fewer miles per kilometer than I was thinking. Okay, so yeah. So sixty six. Wait, six thousand miles? No, because how many kilometers? Nine, is it? Oh, yeah, nine thousand. I'm just going nine thousand kilometers. Okay, yeah, then six six thousand miles. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dang. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a long ways. And it was, you know, four months of riding. So Yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was yeah. thinking that it was I was thinking it was gonna be more like maybe thirty five hundred or something, but I think that five thousand seven hundred and forty seven. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm also kind of like rough estimating by like size across the US, but like across yeah. Canada, it's a lot wider. <laughs> yeah. And, and I will also say like, you can do it in a lot less distance. Um, I was really determined to go visit all 10 provinces. Um, ah. And so, and I wanted to like go see some extra hot springs when I was over like in BC. Heck like, yeah. in the Rockies. Right. Like what is the thing you want to do most <laughs> after you spend all day doing exercise? You want to sit in a hot tub for three hours. You absolutely do. Yep. Um, so <laughs> I definitely added a fair bit of distance um, doing that kind of stuff. Um, nice. It was so worth it. And, and like, actually one of the really cool things that I had um, that made it possible was I had a geared unicycle hub. Um, ah, which is okay. this thing made by a company called Schlumpf Innovations um, that gives you a two-speed unicycle. Um, so you can like, hang on, let me get my converter again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you in miles. Um, because I mean, they don't, they don't like, you know, it's not like a bicycle that can freewheel, right? Like, exactly. Exactly. Like you don't yeah. have, you don't have brake. You, you are the brakes, and yeah, it exactly, is, it's like a fixie. Yeah, you know? it is. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this thing has brakes, uh, so it makes it easier oh, when you're riding back down a mountain. Uh, yeah, you can like nice. put like a little resistance drag on just so you don't mm -hmm. like wear out your knees. Um, but it like, you know, I was I was doing, let me see, I just got the high side, but like I would do like, uh, thank you, Google, between like 12 and 16 miles an hour, like kind of average speed during the day. Like I could really cruise. Nice. Um, and so like without being out there all day long, like I could do like some pretty good distance. And so having that uh, piece of equipment, there's actually a how it's made episode on it, which I think is hilarious. Um, but yeah, it made a huge difference because I could cover a lot more ground um, than I otherwise would have been able to. Um, so like, but yes, I definitely, I took the long way around and I like looped up and down through all the Atlantic provinces. It took me forever. Uh, and it was super worth it. Um, so, yeah. 
And I filmed it all. Ah, cool. And you have so, sold your story for millions of dollars uh, 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 studio. Yeah. And... <laughs> one, one day I'm going to cut that footage together. It turns out, I, I put all this effort in, I did the thing. It turns out I really hate video editing. <laughs> I love a lot of yeah. technical stuff and I hate, I hate it. I, it's not my favorite thing. And so I'm trying to figure out uh, what to do next with it. I have like eight terabytes of footage. Um, yeah, it's a lot. It's Did all you in just 4K, like GoPro like, the whole time, or uh, like... I used a GoPro, a GH5, and a Mavic Air, and so I would like do drone footage of myself riding, and I filmed like some interviews with people I met, and like nice. yeah, it was super fun. Um, but like then I procrastinated so hard, I got a job in a in a pantyhose factory. Um, <laughs> As you and do. <laughs> now you're right. Like, you know, you know it's happened whatever. in life. Uh, <laughs> happens. <laughs> happens yeah, to everyone. And so one day I do intend to make it into something. I have not done it yet. So it's all sitting cool. in a huge guilt pile on my hard drive. So, <laughs> um, But you you took off time from work to do that. and Oh, I fully quit my work. job. I yeah, like, okay. The year before, I set myself a budget. I was like, this is how much money I need to take off. This is how much I think the trip will cost. This is what I want to do after. Uh, I like... I didn't plan like my route down to like the minute detail or anything like that, but like the, I did my best to set myself up for success. Like the, even like the clothes that I bought and like some of the camping gear upgrades that I purchased were like kind of angled towards doing this trip, like um, yeah. lighter tent and lighter sleeping bag and stuff like that. Like, oh, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. It was like, it was definitely a long time coming. I had tried to do it once 10 years previous, but that is like a long and torturous tale. I didn't get super far. I made it to Alberta and then I went home. So um, yeah, it was just really yeah, important to like. So that, but that is also good for people to know because right, they, yeah. people tend to hear only about the successes. And sometimes, especially when you're, when you're doing, when you're trying to do a big thing that you've never done before, sometimes it might take you a couple of tries to be successful and, and that's okay. That's, that's like, that's part of the whole thing. Yeah, no, you know what? That's actually, that's a very good point. And I don't often think about that, but failure is a super important part of success. Um, yes. And also it's, I will also say like, um, through the wisdom of having failed a number of times in my life, sometimes it's important to fail and just walk away like you're never going to pick it back up again. Um, <laughs> and and maybe in a year or two or whatever, depending on the project, then like you know the time will come back around where it's right to like do the yeah. to like complete the thing that you wanted to do. Um, I don't yes. know. Yeah, like time is such a useful tool for for overcoming problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> In, in knitting, we call that hibernating. Pro when pro projects are mm. hibernating, they're like giving you too much yeah. trouble or you don't like them. They're being a pain in the ass for some reason. And it's just like, okay, putting this aside, yeah. hibernating now. <laughs> yeah. And then when you come back to it, though, like with a fresh brain and after yep. like your whatever that is, like your subconscious has had some time to chew on it. Um, yeah. It Yeah. There's like something really cool about that. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I like that in the larger scale, but also in the like day to day scale where you're like, screw this. I'm out of here. <laughs> and then the next morning you're like, that was easy. I should have gone yep. to bed first. Right. Um, oh, so, so many times. Right. So <laughs> many times where you're just like <laughs> oh, standing I, out on something and yep. I give up so easily now and go to bed. Like yep. that is like move number one for me. I'm like, nope. <laughs> I'm going to go write some emails and go to bed. Like. <laughs> I, li I like it. It's like, yes, wisdom we've learned along the way. Just give up and go to bed. It'll be fine tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. I don't know. Anyway. It yeah. is. Yes, um, Bob, is, Bob is saying that very few people follow a strictly linear path through life and many go through multiple iterations. It. That is absolutely true. Absolutely true. Although it's weird. I feel like it's... So that is so true. And yet I feel like it is so weird that still, I don't know, sometimes we feel like failures about not having this like direct linear path, right? Or or that still feels like the expectation somehow or like the thing that we should be doing or the the thing that we should be achieving. And it's like, it's so like, why, 
why is there that narrative? Why is there that narrative? <laughs> yeah, it's so true. It's like I, I one of the things I wanted to do. Yeah, you're like, yes. Um, but one of the things actually that I aim for in my life overall, and I feel like I'm achieving it by and large, um, is like setting my life up to have it, as many interesting opportunities come my way as possible by like just saying yes to the weird stuff and going with it. Um, and I also recognize like there's a lot of privilege and stuff in, um, in that as well. Uh, so yeah. like, I don't say that without qualification, but like, um, it's really cool. Cause like, sometimes you like, it's worth it to take the thing that is what is interesting or like, uh, and just go for it because it leads to other opportunities that you might never have been able to see coming or anticipate. Um, if you're able to like, take that, take the weird way every now and again, I don't know. Um, no, I, I don't agree. know how true that is for everybody, but yeah, like, uh, it's worked for me. So no, I absolutely agree. And, and also what you say about privilege is really true because if you're in a position where it's just a daily marathon or struggle just to meet basic minimum needs, then oftentimes yep. you don't have the luxury of doing the weird things, right? Or you're not Doesn't in it. you're not in the headspace where it sounds like a good idea or that you have the energy to take advantage of it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I just I need to be really clear about that because I know not everyone has the ability yeah. to be like, I'm gonna quit my job and take this other weird job that sounds like it'll be cool, but who knows? Um, we that's can, a leap that work towards a place towards making a place where, where that is possible, where everybody does. Yeah, that exactly. Thing. My God, I only wish, wouldn't that be great? Right. Um, so yeah, but anyway, it's like, it's what landed me, uh, learning about like industrial controls and stuff like that. Um, because I had, you know, gone and explored a lot of this, like stuff on my own, um, because I don't have a traditional engineer background like I was saying earlier. And so it's, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, just, there's a lot of imposter syndrome. <laughs> and so being able to actually do stuff, uh, really, really helps. Um, or being able, being allowed to do stuff professionally really helps. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and I think it's funny too, about like, you know, the whole, like having a traditional engineering background and stuff, because like, even though, yes, I have an engineering degree and you could say that I have mm -hmm. a traditional engineering background, right. I it I did not take classes and what I did in college was not what I'm doing now. And so <laughs> so it's like yes, it set me up for some things in certain ways and it definitely opened doors and gave me opportunities for sure. Um yep. but it did not like the things the classes that I took in college were not what I'm doing now at all. And mm. engineering is such a huge, huge topic. Oh, it's so point. big. Yeah. Right. I mean, nobody yeah. can possibly, you, you, you don't learn everything you need to know in college. Nobody could, you know, and yeah, you can try. Uh, right. But yeah, absolutely. But you're always going to be continuing to learn and you're going to be like learning on the job and learning from other people and maybe learning through your hobbies too. And I think that there's this real fallacy of like, oh, you know, I, I learned this in school and therefore it is somehow like more important. Right. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I'm, I'm getting over it. So yeah, it was a, it was a long journey to be like, oh, I can't, I can't do electrical engineering. What if there's stuff that I didn't learn in the magic sauce, like the magic sauce class, like they just didn't tell They don't tell you on the internet. Uh, <laughs> it's not true. It's absolutely not true. Um, most of the magic sauce stuff was stuff that the props had learned by experience. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. Like, like those were the really interesting gems of information that I picked up in college was mm -hmm. when professors were telling you about these weird things that there was like no way of learning except by actually just like getting out there and doing them. So like this one weird time. Yeah. 100%. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it would illustrate like a point that they were teaching or whatever, but, uh, but yeah, it's, Nobody, yep. nobody learns everything in college. <laughs> yep. Well, and I think it like it helps now. Like I am leading a team of engineers, so I feel like I know. You know, there's a little more. Like, okay, I've made it to some degree. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I have an assembled TV be gone here. I don't have a way nice. of testing it though because we don't actually have a tv <laughs> in 
in the shop. So I'm going to have to take it home and, and test it and then tweet about it. <laughs> it's like the next time you're at the dentist's office, you can like yeah. really, uh, cause some havoc. I just, I want to go to a sports bar. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, right. oh Super Bowl really. Sunday. <laughs> but you don't want to get like physically right. injured though. If, if all of a sudden <laughs> there's an obituary for me, you will know why. Yeah. Do they make just gotta pick your moment flipping channels or is it only on off oh that is a good question i mean i would see i would see no reason why you couldn't also change channels because i i think all of that stuff the same. i think the protocol is for like universal remotes is universal right but Does i don't know not, and i, I have to wrong. Up and find I, out. I thought it sent out like every code it knew like it just like sends oh, every off code, like one after another. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I have I, never I, used one, and I've never built one, but I spent a lot of time reading about them at some point, uh, just because I was like, "Yes, <laughs> this is great," um, <laughs> and I guess that's stuck in my brain. Yeah. It's such a. It's just a great little subversive thing. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're it, very clever. It makes you feel like super. Sneak, super sneaky, like hacker ninja, right? Like, ha ha ha! Mm -hmm. I have this power <laughs> that I shouldn't have. Ha ha ha! ha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, Lee says Lee says that you're also a climber too. Yeah. I am. I have oh. sadly not been climbing lately because of the COVIDs. They close all the gyms in Ontario. I think they're back open again. Um, but it was like, yeah, I love climbing. Uh, nice. One of my I favorite too am a climber. It's nerd golf. That's what one of my friends calls it. Nerd golf. That's hilarious. Like, like, like you know how is. like business people they go like they go to play golf and make business deals or whatever you do while you play golf. Um, you can obviously tell my opinion on golf from my comments. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, for nerds, it's like it's totally climbing. Like all all Obviously. the nerds are going to the climbing gyms and like hiring each other, and like it's like it's just it's really funny to me. Um, that that is that is funny and interesting. I I don't have that same perspective, but no. I think that's more that it's more a function of where I live and how I entered climbing. All right. Uh, and how is that? Through, through nerd because it was through college, but um, <laughs> but did not continue like that. I you know I started climbing outdoors uh, like oh. in LA at Stony Point and met like a whole bunch of awesome people from all sorts of different you know all sorts of different professions and jobs and things like that. Right. And, yeah, it was a really cool, interesting community that was not at all nerd prevalent but i i I'm think so that... jealous of your outdoor climbing i haven't been <laughs> able to really do that much that's so cool yeah um, i haven't been honestly i've been a gym rat lately but um <laughs> yeah that's and it's kind of covid plus time plus i i know people will fight me on this but people uh i i say that there's no good outdoor climbing in san luis obispo we do have some outdoor <laughs> climbing. Like, I think it's crap, and some people are like, oh, are you kidding me? It's great. I'm like, no, you're just saying that because there are no other choices, and you feel like you have to defend your local climbing, but it's crap. It's really crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, like, Toronto is terrible. Like, uh, I grew up in Newfoundland, uh, where it's beautiful, and everything's, like, just nature is awesome, and I currently live in southern Ontario, which has one of the most boring landscapes, in my opinion, of anywhere in North America. Uh, and I have some qualification for that at this point, because uh, I've been to a lot of landscapes in North America. Um, and there's like a couple places to go climbing locally, but there's nothing really great. Um, and so it's a lot easier to just go to the gym <laughs> and like, yeah. you know, get stronger and enjoy doing the puzzles with my brain uh, and not have to drive for like three hours to get to a climbing spot. Yes. So, so that's actually what I first, when you first said it's like, it's like golf for nerds, what my brain went to was the problem solving aspect of it. And yeah. also that it tends 
unless you're like a climber, it tends to be super boring to watch, like paint dry, right? (laughs) 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 I feel like not being a golfer, you know, right? Like golf is super boring for me to watch. (laughs) Yeah, totally. No, I think you, there's a lot of parallels, honestly. Like, um, I kind of love it. Um, And there's, so there's a, there's a Slack community for a newsletter called The Prepared. Uh, yeah. which I don't know if you've heard of. Yeah, okay. Yeah, cool. I, I get the prepared. <laughs> okay, sweet. Yeah. yeah. So they have like a, a yeah. like a, like the members Slack or whatever. Like they have like yeah. a climbing chat for a couple different cities um, where like people meet up and climb and I guess talk about their manufacturing jobs. Um, uh, Cause that's what I've done when I've been at the prepared meetups. So that's um, yeah, but like, it's cool. I don't know. People are like building 3D printers and stuff. It's really neat to hear like how they're doing that. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, but that that's like how I think of climbing nowadays. It's like it's like oh, a networking activity. And that's not actually true. I really like going with my friends. Um, we used to do like Sunday meal prep with like a couple of people, and then we'd like go climbing after as like a big group, and it was just like the most wholesome, lovely way to spend like a Sunday afternoon. Um, like cook food together and then go like hang out at the climbing gym. Um, just absolutely lovely. Um, sadly not happening right now because of COVID, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's good times. It's good times. Yeah. We're, we're usually the clowns at the climbing gym. I will say we're, yeah. we're, we're usually <laughs> the people who are like those people. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Now I like, I don't like, know. We're, we're just, we're usually giving each other a hard time which sometimes right. involves speaking loud and inappropriate comments. And, <laughs> and like, sometimes I don't know, we'll be like singing or dancing or <laughs> right. other ways. Oh, that sounds awesome. Amazing. I support all of this. <laughs> or, you know, uh, sometimes if there are like four of us and, and, you know, if there are two pairs of two and we're like climbing next to each other, sometimes it'll sort of turn into a wrestling match or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> The things that we probably shouldn't be doing, but you know. Amazing. Well, I will send you a message if I'm ever nearby because that sounds great. Yeah, totally. I will bring my space pants um, and my climbing harness. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So Bob asks, okay, if R2 is optional on this TV be gone. So that is a good question. And it's like, I've been trying to kind of like scroll through the instructions and keep a conversation going at the same time and, and solder, yeah. which is difficult then I've probably made mistakes at all of them um <laughs> luckily so you don't I'm, have to test it live right <laughs> so I was given three resistors in the kit um the color code to my weak old 44 year old eyes it looks the same on all of them although one of them is like slightly different and was was not part of the same piece of cut tape as the other two so i'm a little suspicious of that one um i should probably like grab a multimeter maybe to to check this all out but um the instructions basically i i cannot they do not mention r2 and in the final photo of the fully assembled board it is not populated so i'm guessing mm-hmm. that it is optional what they do mention is that r3 um which is right there. So there's like a, a US or Euro kind of resistor. And so if you're in the EU, UK, Australia, place the remaining 10K resistor. Ah, the others are 1K. So this must actually be slightly different, even though the color code looks exactly the same, I swear. One is probably like red and the other is probably orange. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, it says that... Uh, If you're in the EU, UK, or Australia, then place the remaining 10K resistor into R3. Uh, And it will tell the microcontroller to use the EU database. If you are in Asia or North America, do not place R3. So since I am in North America, I will not place R3. But yeah, I I thought that that was interesting. I did not not see mention of R2 for why it is... (laughs) <laughs> where, I, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I know, right? Um, um, 
I love that method though of just like putting a pull down to like reconfigure board behavior. I actually did that for uh for like the the IoT boards for SheerText because like the there's two versions. Mm -hmm. Um and the boards are physically different colors so that you can tell like what you're getting when you grab the different version. Um mm -hmm. but like yeah, just like we put a 10k resistor on so it knows what's what when the code boots up and you'd be like, nope, I don't run here. Uh it's so simple. I love it. I don't know. Um, what a what a clever thing. Interesting. So it looks like it might be a pull down. So it goes to the uh, middle pin on these four trans these four whoop, transistors. Oh. Um, so the middle middle pin on all of those are tied together, and it goes from there and to a plane, which I am guessing is ground. So it might be a pull down on the base of those guys. That, that is not sounds needed, right? For some reason, maybe maybe has internal internal resistors or something. I'm trying to like hmm. look at the. <laughs> so it's, yeah, PN two 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 two. So. Um, I believe that's a NPN. So it might just not be necessary or yeah, I'm not sure. Hmm. I guess if it's like the, is it the TO220? No, what's the name for that package type? I totally forget. Uh, TO92, I want to say. That's the one that yeah. sounds right. Um, the yeah mm -hmm. i wonder if it's just like you, you can use different models and there's like an option if like yeah. the ones that they have aren't available yeah maybe or maybe it was different like originally parts. designed with fets that like needed a mm. pull down and like then they put uh yep you know, npns or something bjt's instead mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. contrary to what dude bro says on twitter uh <clears throat> fets are indeed transistors <laughs> that what who, I actually what? was on YouTube. It was a comment on a video that I recently made with Make. Uh, uh, <laughs> a guy was very adamant about a FET <laughs> completely different from a transistor. <laughs> that that's incorrect. Seriously, and I was just like, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, that's what the two stands for. <laughs> Maybe oh, you're thinking about BJTs, which are also transistors, just a different type <laughs> of transistor. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's yeah brutal. yeah yeah um yeah so this is okay this is really interesting trying to solder to like an aluminum pcb because this thing yeah, keeps tell, things away tell me about making that because i'm curious yeah as to like where, where did you have it made how much did it cost was it like really expensive compared to a normal pcb I learned so much making these it was actually a really cool experience um this was done with a credit with Seed Studio, we had some PCBA done for work, and uh, the credit was going to expire. So I was like, "Hey, hey, hey gonna get my personal projects uh, done yeah. because it's not hurting anyone." Um, and so one of the options they had was for an aluminum PCB, and I was making these lights, and I was like, "Oh, that's so cool! I really want to try that." Um, first thing, for the least expensive type of these, you can't do vias because oh, yeah. you drill a hole, you put a via in and suddenly everything's the, you know. <laughs> so the original version of this board had, like you can see these are like the KiCad, like two pin um, connector layouts, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, two pin, like um, like 0.1 headers, like these, these guys. Um, obviously that doesn't work. And so I got a message back and they were like, uh, you can't do that. That's not how that goes. <laughs> um, and I was like, interesting okay um <laughs> and so that's why i'm doing this really silly um wiring so basically all of these are one color and all of yeah. these are the other color and i'm gonna trim all the ends and solder them together and um that's like that's how i've chosen to do the wiring and then the ground comes out here and there's another wire and so um but it's really interesting because the heat sinking is quite good on the board um, soldering is really difficult because it, it, the minute that your iron leaves, it just hardens right away. It's yeah. just gone. And so that's why I've had to put, um, the solder down first, um, in a little blob. And then I'm attaching my, um, uh, my little 30 gauge wires, uh, because otherwise, uh, yeah, you just, you legit just can't do it maybe like the more traditional way. So <laughs> it's, it's very weird. Um, 
But Are very you cool. A pair of tweezers or what? What's going on there with your iron? A pair, a pair of. Oh, um, this is an. This is an Aoyu 968A. It's got a solder. Uh, this is like a. Oh, um, it has it's a got a tip fume remover. Um, oh. This is like the. It's like a, a rework station. Um, hmm. I got it a little while back. I'm like. Now it's very hard for me to angle a camera to point at it, but um, basically, yeah, it's got like a soldering iron and then you could turn on the smoke absorber, but there's like a, an air pump that'll like pull out air uh, and then filter it through a carbon filter. And then there's also like a rework gun on the side. So it's like kind of an all in one. And it's not the best soldering iron I own, but it's mm -hmm. the one that has the most bang for the buck like on my desk. And so mm -hmm. it tends to sit there and I I just I use it. But yeah, um, I at first found this really bulky and weird and annoying, um, but now it's really nice because I'll just like flip on the smoke absorber when I'm doing stuff like this for hours and I'm not just breathing like flux fumes, which is like yeah. super, super cool. So yeah, nice. um, yep. But yeah, anyway, solder to these things is the weirdest experience in the world. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, it works really well. Um, I'll actually, because I can do this literally like all night, so you're going to have to cut me off at some point. Um, but um, I'll show you. Uh, so these parts, I'll, it's just cool. Like, um, Or I think it's cool because I made it. But... Uh, the when I take this apart, it's just basically a bunch of layers so I can print everything correctly. Um, but the, this is the back of the board. There's a thermistor in here to tell the fan how fast to spin. Um, mm -hmm. But cool. it's like, you know, this just mates to the back and I bought these heat sinks that are like the right size and whatever. But like having that thermal regulation to the board, it works so well. Like I was not expecting it to be quite as functional as it is, mm -hmm. but like I can run this thing at, you know, the 30, the full like 36 watts for like a while um, before I start getting weird thermal overlord short shutdown stuff. Um, and I think it's like one of the first times that I've like over engineered something to the point where I can push it that hard. Like normally I'm like, oh, I messed up some calculations or whatever. And it's just been very satisfying because it's like actually capable. Uh, it, it's kind of overkill and it feels really nice. So, <laughs> you know, um, nice growing as a person so do, do yeah. you have an idea of like what the cost would have been like how much more than than a normal circuit board the cost would have been if you hadn't had the voucher or anything or yeah i think i could it's curious i think it was like really look it up but... between 50 and 75 dollars like for 10 boards of this size mm -hmm. um the quoting is pretty good on their website um mm -hmm. Like most, like JLPCB, I actually they may not do it, um, but uh, Seed definitely does it. There's one other place that will also do aluminum boards that I forget the name of, um, but they will give you a quote if you like upload your Gerbers and like, um, it, I don't know. Yeah, it's worth checking. But the big thing is like making sure that uh, you don't have any that it's a single sided board. Um, that is like super 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 key. Yeah, um, it held up the production. A lot. No electroplating aluminum. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Like, yeah. you know, makes super sense. So, yeah. and I think if you pay a fair bit extra, they, they, they you know, you can do it, but it's just yeah. like the process is a lot more convoluted. Um, yeah. I was inspired to make it because these lights, when I took them apart, um, which, uh, yeah, it involves glue. So I'm not going to do it again, but um, <laughs> they use aluminum boards. This is an aluminum PCB. Uh, with a white, um, like with a white silk screen on it. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't know if it has vias either, actually. I don't mm -hmm. remember. Um, but yeah, so I was like, oh, okay. Like that makes tons of sense. That's why they don't instantly explode when they're on gold brightness. Maybe I will copy that design and see how it goes. So. But you yeah. also have a heat sink on the back and it doesn't look like that one did, or maybe it's like just super thin or something yeah. like that. Yeah, these, so, those that, ones will actually... shut down. Okay, yeah. I yeah. was curious about that because I was like, huh. Oh, so did you do the aluminum PCB kind of as uh because you could and wanted to? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Or, yeah. yeah like, <laughs> why not just put a bigger heat sink on it or something or you know, add a fan yeah. or yeah. But I want to see how it would go. And it works, it works really well. So and, and I think the applications are super limited. It's like mostly for LEDs that that they're used, I think. Um mm -hmm. 
but yeah i don't know it was a cool experiment um and like uh it's nice because they can go for a fair while before they start like my lights before they get hot enough that you have to even like bother turning the fan on but it's there as an option um mm -hmm. just in case um but yeah. it should ideally you know your lights should be silent because they're just right light yeah sound um <laughs> yep. so yeah all right let me see yeah. my last wire yeah, I, I agree, Bob. I wonder, he says, I wonder if the remote codes are different for NTSC and PAL. Um, mm, I kind of, yeah. I'd kind of forgotten about PAL. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Different, the different yeah. broadcast standards. I don't, I'm not sure. I feel like there's no I, technical I reason think, for them to be different. I would, yeah, I, I would think that the, that the video format would not, necessarily be related to like the ir remote codes um yeah. but i could be completely wrong there could be something you know that is now i'm, I'm some sort of weird up. link between the two for sure um yeah 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 um cool. all right that is Probably about as much as I'm gonna get done tonight. I got two of them done. This has been a labor of love. Slowly, <laughs> you can only imagine. Like when I was working on like uh, on like all this stuff, this just took ages. Um, so but, how many uh, how many lights are you making, or how many? So there's eight in total. Uh, yeah. So I've got eight um, of everything, basically. Um, I ordered 10 boards and I screwed up two of them. So then I ordered the parts to make like eight uh, of the rest of them. Um, and frankly, I think it's going to be enough. I'm probably going to have like two like above me here, like a couple in the background, one over the 3D printer, one over my desk. Nice. Um, and I'll probably have a couple spares. Um, oh, there was like something else just popped into my head that I was going to talk about. Mm, nope, gone. <laughs> it's all good. I can relate. Um, <laughs> happens to me all the time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like there was. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah, nope, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so eight of them should be totally fine. And hopefully I'll have them done at some point before next year. That's like, that's the real goal with like personal projects, right? Is like how much time you can afford to uh, actually spend on them. But yep. um, we're getting there. Cool. So, yeah. That's cool. Awesome. I think that's probably like a pretty good, pretty good stopping point, wrapping it up. Yeah. Right? So yeah. Thanks so much for chatting. It's been Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me on. Um I had a great time. Uh, yeah, this was super fun. Um, and thank you to Lee for making this happen. Woo woo. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh super appreciate Lee. Uh at all times. What a lovely human being. For sure. Us too. Yeah. <laughs> awesome <laughs> cool all right well thank you everybody for tuning in thank you bob we'll see you all next week i don't know what next week is going to be yet we'll figure it out as we go Woohoo! <laughs> bye